Be the great mother of God, Mary most holy, and blessed be God in his angels and his saints. Amen. Friends, I have the pleasure of being able to introduce our speaker for today, Timothy P. O'Malley, professor of the practice. He's the director of education at the McGrath Institute for Church Life, and he's the academic director of the Notre Dame Center for Liturgy. He holds a concurrent appointment in the Department of Theology right here at the University of Notre Dame. Thanks, John, uh, and thanks for being here today. I am a first-generation college student, uh, and I went to Notre Dame, and therefore, as a faculty member, uh, I like sorts of things about universities that a lot of faculty members might find uh, too emotional or too ritualistic. And one of these things, in fact, are the seals of universities. Uh, I love a, a good, and I don't mean a seal of a university, like a, an animal of a university, though I would love those. Um, uh, I, I mean the sort of ways that universities present themselves. And in fact, if you look at many of these seals, you can see the once religious roots of many of the institutions that we at Notre Dame call our peer institutions. For example, Harvard, perhaps the world's most famous university seal. Uh, once upon a time, Harvard's seal, of course, has this central word, veritas, meaning truth. Uh, but around it, once upon a time, it's been eliminated. It says, for Christ and for church, right? So this was the roots of Harvard uh, in the religious formation of the early United States. Harvard's not alone, right? Duke, uh, really one of Notre Dame's peer institutions par excellence today, still has on its seal uh, eruditio et religio, right? Uh, erudition or learning and religion. Duke was affiliated with the Methodist Church and still is. Columbia, uh, you know, very famous, I think, if you've seen the musical Hamilton. Uh, uh, Columbia, once Kings, was affiliated with the Anglican uh, and then the later Episcopalian churches, on their seal is, in thy light, we shall see light itself, right? And it's taken from Psalm 36, and of course is a vision of learning. Not only do you find such religious imagery on institutions founded as, re as religiously affiliated, you also find them on seals like Cal Berkeley, one of the first institutions without a religious affiliation, nonetheless includes on their seal the opening words of Genesis, let there be light. Stanford, the most uh, irreligious of institutions, uh, <laughs> such that their band remains banned from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, across the bay from, sorry, it's true. Uh, 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 it's a very lovely institution, uh, but uh, uh, has on their seal uh, the words of an enlightenment humanist from Germany, nonetheless, with a kind of religiosity implied German, die Luft der Freiheit weit, or uh, the winds of freedom blow, right? Um, and I hope that the winds of our freedom blow across them uh, Thanksgiving weekend. <laughs> so it leads us to a question. Who's on our seal? Right? What is on our seal and perhaps who is on our seal? At the center of the University of Notre Dame, you find this on our commencement robes, you find this on graduation things. Now you even find them in classrooms where the seal of the university is on the lecture podium. It is Vita Dolcedo Spes, life, sweetness, and hope. Now these words, right, might be to describe the alma mater. Those of us lucky enough to have attended this institution view it as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. But of course, in fact, these words are not about Notre Dame as university per se. 
but they're about Our Lady. It's Vita Dolcedo Spes Nostra, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. These are words taken from the Salve Regina. Now you might think as a university, most Catholic universities must care about Mary, right? Certainly we do. <laughs> Here she is, regilded in all her glory, overlooking campus. Right uh, on top, we have the grotto here at Notre Dame. In fact, you might think most universities, even our color scheme is founded on the Blessed Mother. Uh, I, this is something I researched. I did my PhD at Boston College. And the maroon and gold prominent at Jesuit institutions was, was chosen as the, the, the colors of the papal court. Uh, whereas the University of Notre Dame's gold and blue is taken from Our Lady, right? And that's why our basilica is decked in the very same colors. So what I wanna to ask today is what might we learn about Notre Dame's mission, the institution, from this devotion to Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope? I wanna begin, of course, with the text itself from which this was taken, a favorite hymn of Father Soren, it's the Salve Regina. The origins of the Salve Regina are a little bit complicated to determine. We suspect that the Salve Regina emerged in a Cistercian context. Uh, by the 12th century, we have evidence of it being sung. By the 13th century, it's officially in the liturgy of Cistercian communities. Of course, the Salve Regina, as it develops, becomes one of the most popular songs of the day. To use the, the lingua franca of some of my undergraduates, it slaps. Um, and it started slapping partially because of the Dominicans who began to do processions around the Salve Regina, uh, and particularly processions that included at universities a remarkable number of undergraduates. It was the favorite song of undergraduates. I always think about this, like could you imagine Notre Dame students ending the night not with the alma mater at the linebacker lounge, but the Salve Regina. <laughs> Uh, people on ships, right? Uh, 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 of course, Mary has a deep connection to the sea. Her name, uh, uh, Maris, uh, Maris in Latin, Stella Maris, a star of the sea. Uh, and so it, it, the, the Salve Regina became sort of the image, the favorite song of those who worked on ships. And in fact, they would sing it while they were working on ships. This is a remarkable text that has extreme value to the totality of the Christian tradition. And to hear this sort of slap, the, the, the slappiness of it, um, I think most of us when we sing chant, sing it wrong. Um, Catholic parishes are like, it's Lent, so it's time to sing chant now that we're penitential and boring. Um, it's not a great way to teach chant, right? Like, we're gonna sing chant, which means be sad. Chant actually has a, a great sort of levity to it. Uh, it's intended to sort of feature the words, right? Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Docedo et Spes Nostra Salve. Ante clamamus exules fili eve, ante susperamus gementes et flentes, in hac lacrimarum vale. Uh, you're supposed to sound like that when you're chanting instead of sad and boring, right? Uh, this, this text, uh, Salve Regina, Mater misericordiae, vita dolceto, ad spas nostra salve. Ad te clamamus, ex ulas filii eve. Ad te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in hac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, Ilos tuos, misericordes oculos, ad nos convete. Ad Jesum, benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium, o sante, o clemens, 
ओ पिया ओ जुचिस वेगो मारिया Right that's wow it's supposed to sound Now, what does the text mean, right? It's a sort of classical uh, devotion to Mary, right? Um, Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, right? These are titles of Mary we've covered partially over our lecture series this year thus far. But the interruption from title becomes very devotional and personal right away. It's our life, our sweetness, and our hope, right? Imagine, right? Um, If you're like asking someone out on a date, uh, you know, like, or you're dating someone, you're like, "Baby, you're my life. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, you're my sweetness. <laughs> you're my hope." Uh, um, right? It, it, it has a, a tenderness to it that is distinct. These are not just formalized titles; they're tenderly expressed. And yet, we, these children of Eve, right? Uh, who live in this valley of tears and crying and lamentation right a uh, happy football saturday um <laughs> right for medieval persons it was often a valley of tears and lamentation right death was around you in particular kinds of ways right we had a pandemic for 2 years and we thought to ourselves this is the end of the world they had a pandemic that lasted for 400 years Right? This is a world of death and a world in which therefore judgment seems to be at hand at all the time. And yet, who cares? It's our advocate, Mary, right, who shares the same flesh as her son. That's what makes her assumed into heaven, sharing the same flesh as her son, right? Um show us the face of Jesus, right? Of show us the face of the fruit of your womb, the blessed fruit of your womb. right the very flesh and blood that you bore into the world when we die show us his face that's the salve regina where did this come from and how did this enter into the latin west in this way well marian hymns are not new uh ephrem the syrian in 373 has a hymn on the nativity in which he imagines mary singing a lullaby to jesus But as you can see this lullaby isn't necessarily the most tender even if the language by the way is very beautiful. While you dwelt with me both in me and outside of me your majesty dwelt. While I gave birth to you openly your hidden power was not removed from me. You are within me and you are outside of me O mystifier of his mother. Right? Um imagine singing a lullaby to your child like this. Uh <laughs> right but but mary recognizes who jesus is right she sings this hymn to him what can i call you a stranger to us who was from us shall i call you son shall i call you brother right this is a traditional sort of marian motif in lyric right she is given birth to her son but is she not also a brother right uh, redeemed in christ so this sort of relationship Shall I call you bridegroom? Shall I call you Lord, O you who brought forth his mother in another birth out of the water, referring to baptism. Right? So, and of course the baptism of the Christian. So, this Marian hymns were really quite prominent, uh, especially in the East. And yet, Marian devotion in the Latin West is surprisingly later to arrive. Many of the most prominent Marian feast days were not necessarily even ad adopted by the time of Gregory the Great in the 6th century. Feasts that we celebrate regularly, the feast of the Assumption and the feast of the Annunciation. Gregory the Great, of course, features Mary in his preaching, but he doesn't quite sort of th these feasts don't exist. But once they do exist and they begin to exist in Rome, Rome takes up Marian devotion and does so in the most delightful of ways. The Salus Populi Romano, the image on your left, is of course in St. Mary Major. This is a miraculous image of the Virgin. And on the feast of the Assumption, it was taken out of St. Mary Major and processed down to St. John Lateran, 
where there was yet another miraculous icon, Christ the Savior, who was taken out. And these two icons would kiss one another in front of the Lateran, and then they would do a dance. This was a, a root of a kind of Assumption Marian pilgrimage on August 15th that took place in Rome. But to really understand where the salve, salve comes from, we have to get to the heart of what was Marian devotion arising in the high Middle Ages, right? When turn to Mary becomes ubiquitous. We find this in Anselm of Canterbury and his uh, meditations and prayers on the Virgin. For Anselm, it was not just about uh, praying to Mary as a way to prevent, her f uh, to prevent her son from judging us. He makes a turn where he wants to look through the eyes of Mary at the life of Christ. He wants to use her eyes to see Jesus. In one of these prayers, he prays, O woman, full and overflowing with grace, Plenty flows from you to make all creatures green again. O virgin blessed and ever blessed, whose blessing is upon all nature. O highly exalted, when the love of my heart tries to follow you, whither do you escape the keenness of my sight? You actually start seeing uh, love poetry entering in, right? Uh, you can imagine, I know undergraduates have written this text message to their beloved. <laughs> O oh, beloved, to gaze upon, lovely to contemplate, delightful to love, whither do you go to evade the breath of my heart? Have mercy, lady, upon the soul that pants after you with longing. Anselm's desire is for Mary to be with him so he can see Christ with her. This Marian devotion continues in Bernard of Clairvaux. Um, he has, of course, one of the most famous sermons on Mary in his uh, homilies and praise of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In number four in particular, he takes up the place of a narrator outside of the Annunciation, exhorting Mary to say yes, right? Waiting for this. The drama is on display. My lady, say this word which earth and hell and heaven itself are waiting for. The very King and Lord of all, he who has so desired your beauty is waiting anxiously for your answer and assent by which he proposes to save the world. If you let him hear your voice, then he will let you see our salvation. Right? Bernard uh, moves so close to say like all creation is kind of bending down to try to hear what she's going to say. And the monk himself is meant to take up this posture, for he, like Mary, hears the word and must offer his yes, right? So there is this Marian devotion connected to monastic life itself. Bernard, on the Feast of the Assumption, which quickly becomes the most sort of uh, delightful of Marian feasts in the Latin West, uh, begins this homily on the Assumption. These homilies, by the way, were rarely probably not preached in public as they were. They're intended to be read by monks in the quiet of their cell, reflecting on the mystery given. Bernard prays, our earth today sent to heaven a precious gift, referring to Mary, right? This is the gift we give back to God, that by giving and receiving a happy bond of friendship, human affairs should be joined to the divine. The Assumption is the space where divinity and humanity meet and love. The earthly should be joined to the heavenly and the highest to the lowest. The Blessed Virgin, when she goes on high, will give gift to humans. She is the queen of heaven. She is merciful, right? Uh, this is one of the reasons um, Bernard is often noted as the potential author of the Salve. You hear much of the Salve's language in Bernard's own rhetoric. She's the mother of the only begotten Son of God. Nothing can so commend the greatness of her power and holiness. And unless you think that the Son of God does not honor his mother, do you doubt entirely that the womb of Mary, and this is one of the most delightful lines, um, in which God is love rested bodily for nine months, right? Doesn't say Jesus. Uh, in which God is love rested bodily for nine months has passed over into the attachment of love. The God who is total love in her womb now 
in that attachment wants to belong next to her for all time. God desires her. And the great marriage on this feast for Bernard is that therefore God desires us, for she is our mother and our sister. Around the same time, you have sequences or texts written. Adam of St. Victor at a monastery that was outside of Paris, the Abbey of St. Victor, uh, and among the Victorines, is known for his writing of sequences. Sequences are poetic compositions that occurred before the Alleluia and before the Gospel. And they were meditations upon sp specific moments of the feast. We have a couple still today. Uh, the Corpus Christi sequence, Lauda Zion, for Our Lady of Sorrows, right? There's a sequence. These are poetic compositions. Adam of St. Victor wrote a myriad number of these compositions. This beautiful sort of artistic work in which Mary is praised on the Feast of the Assumption uh, for all that she has done and all that God has done for her. I brought the text itself because I, I didn't have space to put it, but you have to hear some of the Latin to really understand uh, the beauty of the text uh, as it is. So the, the text I have from you is, uh, Mother Eve gave over to death humanity, despoiled of the stole of life through guilt, referring to Genesis. Um, death recedes, salvation is given, and life returns through the Virgin Mary. Uh, this, uh, the Latin shows how playful and poetic it is. Eva mater per reatum, stola vita, spoliatum, morti dedit ominum. Colpa perit mors recedit, dator salus vitae redit, per Mariam virginem. Right? Uh, it's, it's playful, it's pleasant, it plays with sort of words and uh, alliteration. He goes on to address the virgin powerful and kind, worthy of angels' praise. Full of God's grace, we sing your praises. We implore you from our heart, delete our sins. Right? Because Mary is praiseworthy, because she has this praise in heaven, she can forgive those sins. And yet she remains, right, ironically, like uh, we've seen before, she's the creator of the Redeemer, magnificent begetter of the Creator. Through you, your only Christ becomes our restorer, our consoler. And the text concludes most marvelously, work of true piety and the beauty of chastity, both interior and exterior, so that our lives may be beautiful, speciosa, right? Uh, most beautiful, most in harmony. And our deaths may be precious in the sight of the Lord. The assumption becomes an occasion to reflect on the kind of ways that our lives have to be shaped according to this Marian wisdom to the beauty of Mary, the mother of God. Men were not the only composers of these texts. The great uh, Hildegard of Bingen, who uh, is among the most uh, brilliant intellectual lights of the 12th century. Hildegard was a doctor. She, she knew medicine. She wa was a musician. She was a theologian. She preached to her local community. Uh, so she knew all these sorts of things. Um, but she has these Marian antiphons that were to be sung by the community. And this one reveals that Mary is the crown of creation forever transformed. O oh, resplendent jewel and unclouded beauty of the sun, poured into you a fountain springing from the Father's heart. She calls her, O oh, resplendent jewel, right? The jewel is already beautiful, right? Mary is beautiful from the beginning. Human nature is beautiful from the beginning. And yet what it needs is the light of the Father to pour forth from it so that it lights up. What is that light? It's the only word by which he created the primal matter of the world, which Eve threw into chaos. For you, the Father fashioned this world into a man. Right, this is addressed to Mary. For you, right, for you, Mary, this unfolded. So you are that luminous matter through which the word breathed forth all virtues, as in the primal matter he brought forth all creatures. Mary is the space of the new creation, of what humanity was always intended to be if we had only not sinned. And even language of purity and virginity are attached more to this, right? I've never given birth. <laughs> 
that was probably obvious, but some of you maybe know of Arnold Schwarzenegger's work in the movie Junior. But right, this is difficult, right? It's the pains of, of, of reality, the pains of life and death and birth and childhood and all the things, right? Birth and death are so closely linked to each other. And yet, right, this is the redemption of those things. Creation can become what creation was always meant to be. How did this eventually develop further? These are high Latin culture, right? These are texts that were primarily known by monastics who were literate. Marian devotion actually spreads well outside of this. You have to understand, people knew Mary like uh, you know each other. Everywhere you went, there were statues and images of her. You prayed to her. You were devoted to her. One of the prominent ways this unfolded was through the little office of the Virgin. In this little office, a liturgy of the hours, often done by lay people, but by monks too. These books were created in which you, the reader, would contemplate the life of Mary at the same time that you prayed the divine office. Often at the beginning of these texts, what do you see but an image of the Annunciation? As you say, O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare thy praise. Mary is there preparing to say the same thing. Let it be done to me according to thy word. Of course, the great part of these books is that all of life was taken up into it. Here you have an image of farmers. This is a calendar page. And the various dimensions of the calendar would be taken up. So the saint lives would be included in these calendars, uh, like the days by which you were supposed to celebrate the saints and what level of feast it was. So it was helpful to know how to pray the office this way. But it also included things that happen in certain times. Some of these calendars, like in the spring, had courting season. So it had a, it had a couple going out for a walk together. Uh, there's farming season. So it had mundane life depicted in the midst of the sacred life of the church. Of course, then there's vernacular poetry. Right? I want to read one of these and then play a little bit of a song that you've probably heard, a vernacular song that's mixed with Latin, which the language of Latin then is adapted to people. There's this such lyric, probably from the 13th century, a goodly orison to Our Lady, speaks of Mary using the language of the vernacular, which can become all the more tender because it's our own speech. It's the speech of normal folk. Gentle mother of Jesus, holy Mary, light beam of my life, beloved lady, bend my knee in loyalty to you, right? I can't bend my knee, but you can. And all my heart blood dedicate to you. You are my life and hope, my spirit's light, my sure salvation, and my heart's delight. Right? These vernacular lyrics and carols spread this sort of cult of Mary beyond right, liturgical context alone and to all of life. Um, I have now one uh, song that needs to be played. This is the uh, very famous, uh, There is no rose of such virtue as is the rose that barred Jesu. It's a Christmas carol. <laughs> Very beautiful. Um, 
a great sort of Christmas song. I always tell parishes that this is actually what you should do on the Immaculate Conception. Uh, it's the it's the best sort of song for this, and it can be sung by anyone. You don't need to sing it in harmony. And there are translations that are not in the sort of Middle English register, but it's more fun to say "Such for two. Um, okay, so. Uh, the, these sort of lyrics uh, m- uh, move around. They're, they're lyrics that anyone could sing. They would have been known. There are lyrics of lamentation in which mothers who've lost their children hear Mary crying out at her own lament upon the cross for her son. There's also the beginning of the most beautiful, delightful statutes that you can feasibly imagine. Both of these are found in the cloisters a- at the Met. Um, if you are ever in New York, I cannot recommend enough well, first of all, leave New York, but uh, I'm just kidding. Right. But then after you're in New York, uh, go to the cloisters on the outside. It, it's like this monastic sort of compound medieval, but it has all of the, medieval, the Met's medieval art collection. It's extraordinary. And so you run into these statues as you're walking around. Uh, this is one from Burgundy, likely from the 14th century, the one on your left. Uh, I took this when I was there. I mean, just look at the image of Mary, like truly smiling. Earlier images of Mary had her somewhat sort of uh, uh, dourish or uh, regal looking, right? And now you he- see this sort of remarkable smile, and then on her lap is Jesus, who is simultaneously smiling, right? Not as the judge of the world, and necessarily, uh, though he is, uh, but the judge who comes in the infancy of the delight, right? This sort of love that's displayed. And you can imagine, uh, there was a narrative once upon a time that medieval people didn't believe in childhood or anything, and that's been proved entirely wrong. They had great games for children, and they played with children all the time, and they they thought children shouldn't work till they were seven or eight years old. (laughs) Listen, things gotta get done. Uh, 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 My son is here, and I'd appreciate him getting to work. Okay, so. There's this other statue of Mary that's also, uh, this one's from the 14th century. She's dressed regally still as this sort of uh, almost royal maiden figure, but her son is just grabbing her veil uh, across, uh, and the Lord of heaven and earth is like, I want that. Um, (laughs) And and so there is a kind of playfulness in this image, right, that here the, the motherhood of Mary is something that one can relate to, not as a saccharine thing, This isn't some sort of like um, precious moments, Mary, Um, right? Uh, It actually reveals the depth of the incarnation, right? That God became human enough to play with his mom and that his mom had to deal with it. Okay. This presence, of course, extends well outside into all sorts of degrees of processions and ritual acts. Uh, The very famous sort of building at Sharp uh, in France, uh, which Father Soren undoubtedly knew about. Uh, It was the sort of prominent location. And to say that this place burnt down is an understatement. It actually, you know, the main building burnt down once. This cathedral probably burnt down or was destroyed in war five separate times. In the name of this cathedral, Notre Dame. Uh, it's the, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's concurrent with the Notre Dame in Paris, uh, in Chart. And what you see in this image is this extraordinary um, relic. Uh, it was known as Mary's birthing garment. Whether it's historically Mary's birthing garment isn't the question. Um, because part of the assumption and narrative around the assumption when it developed in the Latin West is that various Marian clothing came to reside all over Europe. So a number of churches had Mary's girdle because she threw it down from heaven. Uh, or various sort of clothing items that were had. But why was this piece important? Uh, it was used often, I mean, Schott was in extraordinarily under uh, attack and derision during this period of time. Uh, There was violence and there was war, and yet uh, they would process with this that the the cathedral dedication feast was the nativity of Our Lady in September. And they would sing these great sort of hymns, these sequences, these hymns of praise to Mary on these days. And they built this reliquary right here in this image is God entering into history. No matter what happens in war and violence and destruction, right, the presence of salvation reigns. And in fact, uh, it, it was out of this that a sort of peace movement arises in the midst of Europe, a peace movement that war should end and we should dwell peaceably with one another. And it's from this sort of important sort of Marian image, that uh, relic that in fact never leaves itself behind. It 
continues to occupy the French consciousness even until today. Mary wasn't just used in relics. There's an extraordinary work by Heinrich von Mugelen called Der Meinkranz, The Maid's Crown, in which all of the liberal arts offer a hymn of praise about their own excellence because they want to be the crown jewel in Mary's crown. So metaphysics has a turn of place. Alchemy, which was considered a liberal art, uh, has a place in the crown. But of course, the highest place of the crown, and I can say this is true as a professor in the said department partially, is theology. Uh, and in fact, theology cries out at the end, for that reason may I stand in the crown, for her womb enclosed the eagle, lion, and lamb through one word. Through Mary, right? who possessed all wisdom and knowledge because in her the word was made flesh. So eventually at the end of this work, the liberal arts almost all bow down in adoration of Mary. And this is written in high medieval German. You find this in sort of this turn in art to the naturalist's dimension of what's unfolding. This famous work is entitled The Marode Altarpiece. It's from 1427 to, or 1428. It's from the studio of Robert de Campen. And it features the Annunciation, right? But a sort of realistic image of the Annunciation as if it's in everyday normal life. There is Mary reading a book. Often as in Annunciation images, the angel comes, Joseph is next door, working on carpentry, and the world is facing out, the world is entering into this moment. You see this kind of realism on display. Of course, Joseph is working using instruments uh, that all are linked to Jesus' eventual death, uh, but that's a different story. So, um, but you see that you're called in like these patrons to dwell and kneel before the Blessed Virgin Mary. At this moment of the Annunciation, the book is turning in the background with an open window directly behind a space where the spirit might enter in. This same realism is a part of one of the most gorgeous images of the Blessed Virgin, popularly known as the Madonna Fire Screen. It's also from the studio of Robert de Campen. You can find it in the National, National Gallery in London. Here, right, you have this very strange image of Mary, right, in a normal, her halo is very normal and mundane. It's a fire screen to protect the fire. She is offering her breast, which was an image of mercy, right, in art, was an image of mercy. She's come to feed her infant son, Christ. But of course, you'll notice around her that there are things that people don't generally have when they're feeding their infant, like a chalice <laughs> or a Roman missile. Um, and in fact, Mary functions in this image somewhat like an altar herself on her lap is the infant Christ. And you'll notice that, he's that his legs are placed very oddly, um, right? A lot of babies don't sit like that. Um, it turns out that what was hidden in this image was in fact Jesus' uh, male member, which had been recently circumcised. And so this is an image of uh, uh, pointing towards Christ's suffering and the fact that on the altar, the suffering is made available and offered to the people. And the breast that's offered is not offered actually to Christ, as it turns out. It's offered to the viewer, who is likely a Dominican. This was for private use within a cell. Uh, and so this is a, it's offered to you because milk uh, was understood as blood made accessible in a way that we could consume it, right? The child is given blood through, through this way. So it's a Eucharistic image, but it's so also mundane and uh, the, the, the natural dimensions are taken up in it. There's more that I could do, but I feel like we need to land the plane. Um, I'll simply note that there are remarkable moments in which courtly love poetry is taken up also into this work. Uh, this very famous sort of uh, French poem, My Mistress Possesses Every Virtue, Everybody Pays Her Homage, For She Is Full of Worth, as ever as any goddess was, is actually taken directly up into the polyphony of Francesco de Penalosa's 15th century mass, Ave Maria Peregrina. And it has as the very base part, the French motet of romance taken up as it describes uh, the, the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world, and yet Mary's at the center of all of this. 
Friends, lest you think this is only some European phenomenon, in the 16th century, Mary goes on the road. Um, right? It's into this new world that we're awakened most radically to the Christocentric humanism brought about by the Blessed Virgin. Our Lady of Guadalupe encounters Juan Diego, forgotten, a suffering person, ignored by the powers that be, suffering under colonialism, right, uh, of an entire Native people suffered and subjugated under colonial work. The work of evangelization isn't working, right? The, the same Spaniards who killed your father now want you to become Christ, to become Christian. So Mary comes, right? And she speaks to him and says, Juan, I want you to go and build a temple to me, right? On a site of a previous sort of pagan temple, uh, Aztec temple. And Juan goes to tell the bishop and the bishop's like, absolutely, you, you are not a trustworthy person. And then he goes back, and Mary says, well, why don't you go again? And the bishop's like, absolutely, you are not a trustworthy person. And then Juan's uncle gets sick, and he's trying to hide from Mary. It's a, a hilarious sort of scene in the account. He's trying to hide. He's like, oh, I don't want to run into the beautiful lady again. Uh, and so I'm going to go another way, uh, except Mary's like, absolutely not, Juan. Uh, I, <laughs> I got you. Um, and what does she say to him? Listen and hear well in your heart, my most abandoned son, that which scares you and troubles you is nothing. Do not let your countenance and heart be troubled. Do not fear that sickness or any other sickness or anxiety. Am I not here your mother? Are you not under my shadow and my protection? Am I not your source of life? Are you not in the hollow of my mantle where I cross my arms? Who else do you need? Let nothing trouble you or cause you sorrow. Right? Um, here, right, is the dignity of Juan is recognized as beloved, right, by the mother of God, right? And lest you think that this has stopped. Uh, even today, right, uh, artists such as this have composed extraordinary images of Our Lady of Guadalupe <laughs> lifting up the dignity of those forgotten, of the imprisoned. Um, an extraordinary image uh, showing a man in his devotion to Our Lady and her appearance on his back, revealing dignity anew, the dignity of every man and woman. As we come to our near conclusion, I wanted to nearly end with Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz is another one of these polyglots, uh, a religious woman in Mexico in 1695. She composes what's called an auto sacramentale, a mystery play in, uh, about the sacrament of the Eucharist that she actually wrote for the Spanish court. And she entitles it The Divine Narcissus, uh, which may not sound uh, uh, nice, but what is it talking about? Uh, well, it, referring to the myth of Narcissus, right? That he looks into the water and he sees his own image and he can't turn away because he so loves himself. Well, she writes this. It's, well, what if Narcissus is in fact uh, Christ? Uh, and is to be redeemed. So she tells the story of salvation through Narcissus. But at last, right, there's the moment in which he's supposed to look in the water. And who is there for Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz than Mary? Human nature. Christ looks not, a, Narcissus does not look at himself. He looks at her. Um, heaven and earth conspire to surround her with a fiery glow the heavens with its lantern, the meadow with its flowers, everything in the heavenly spheres serves her as an adornment. But no, such a beauty without equal surpasses all the diligence of earth or heaven to fashion. He describes her later on, right, as Mary using the language of the Song of Songs. Pink of pomegranate seeds paints her cheeks. Her two lips parted as a rosy ribbon embellish her delicate voice that puts choirs to shame and exhales wisdom and the scent of carnations. Her mouth pours forth milk and honey. Her lips distill honeycombs. Of course, Sor Juana uh, would, would have been very familiar and in fact believed in the Immaculate Conception at this stage. But notes, right, in Mary, all of humanity is on display. Christ falls in love with humanity over again in the Virgin Mary. And, of course, uh, the, the, the whole play ends with Narcissus, right, 
the way that his memory, the, the myth is that he eventually dies and becomes the flower, right? The flower Narcissus. It, it's white. It's a white flower. Uh, this, of course, uh, Sorwana concludes by the, it's the Eucharist, which is this white flower that reminds us of this depths of love. All right, so how can we conclude all of this? We started trying to talk about Notre Dame's mission, and now I want to wrap it up. How can we learn about Notre Dame's mission from devotion to Mary as life, sweetness, and hope? Friends, I don't know if you're aware of this, but throughout the United States, the liberal arts are under remarkable attack. The humanities are uh, experiencing sort of closing down departments and firing a faculty. Here at Notre Dame, let's remember that actually Our Lady stands on top of a dome of which the top of the dome are the seven liberal arts. For at the center of this is not just learning liberal arts for its own sake, it's actually something essential to what it means to be human. Something about our education must always be grounded in the great human questions that arise in the human heart, uh, right? What is love and what is goodness and what is beauty? Because these are the questions, right, that Christ comes to answer most fully in the Blessed Virgin. Mary in the dignity of the human person, we see again and again that medieval persons and then later on came to recognize their own dignity, their own humanity in this moment in which Mary uh, becomes like them. In this sense, our education can never depart from this, right? The question of human flourishing, of human happiness, of human dignity must be at the heart of every single thing we do. This is what it means, I think, for our university to speak of itself as a force for good, right? Stanford is also a force for good. Right? Um, but what makes our goodness is distinct is that we can never forget that at the center of our mission are those who are not here at all and will never be here. Right? The suffering, the hungry, the thirsty, the dignity of the least of these. Right? True excellence means bending down in love. That is the source of our dignity. Lastly, something about a research university like our own, can sometimes make you forget that our students here, in fact, are not just future doctors or lawyers or whatever. They're human beings who have some really big questions and they experience the fullness of sorrow and joy alike. And it not it fitting that at the very heart of our campus, Right at the heart of campus, at the heart of our imagination, is not a lecture hall as good as this one is. Right? It's a grotto where people go in their lives to light candles when they find out that their mom is dying from cancer, when they're engaged, when their beloved breaks up with them, when they have an exam for my class. <laughs> There they go. <laughs> because no matter our students, no matter how wonderful they are, will always, uh, no matter what they accomplish, will always be most of all beloved human beings who are born and who will also one day die. And Notre Dame, our mother, the alma mater that we are, invites that to be taken up. So friends, as we conclude, I thought it would be right and just for us now to fully sing the Salve one more time together. You've heard it. Uh, now um, I invite you to stand. And let's sing this one more time, um, but with, with a little bit more speed than you normally do when you're sad and <laughs> boring. Ready? Yeah. All right. Salve Regina. Mate misericordiae, vita dolce do, aspas nostra salve. A te clamamus, ex solas fili heve, a te suspiramus, gementas ad flantas, in hoc lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, advocata nos 
nostra y los tuos misericordes oculos ad nos confate ad Jesum benedictum fructum ventris tui nobis post hoc exilium O Sante, O Clemens, O Pia, O Dulcis, Virgo Maria.